Yep. You got a thing, but I can't carry it. <laughs> you don't need that. You can just hold it. You come down here, you can have that mic all yourself.
Hey, now, I, I'm glad you sang out loud like you did. I'm proud of you. I'm proud of all of you. I just want to say, may the Lord bless you and bless your parents and bless Scott for working with this, and I thank God for our children. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to be preaching from Exodus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and 2 Kings. The first one will be Exodus chapter 34. I'm in continuously, this will be myth number 10, lies that parents tell themselves. My child will do as I say, not as I do. How many times have we said that or heard that? In November of 1986, a group called the Beatsy Boys, well, they released a song that took the youth culture by storm and, and the children and the teenagers and the youth were singing it over and over and over again. The title of it is, You Gotta Fight for Your Right to Party. Now, it was a controversial song. It was a controversial group. Now, it was being sung repeatedly by 90%, 90% of all the children they think here in the United States. It's a typical song. I want to give you the lyrics. I tried to get Jim to do this rap song, but he wouldn't do it. And Scott thought maybe it would be best if I did but I hate the children are not in here. <laughs> I'm going to do my best. It says, kick it. <laughs> you wake up late for school. Man, you don't want to go. You ask your mom, please, but she still says no. You miss two classes and no homework, but your teacher preaches class like you gone some kind of jerk. You got to fight for your right to party. Your pops caught you smoking, and he says, no way. Well, that hypocrite smokes two packs a day. Man, living at home is such a drag. Now your mom threw away your best porno mag. Bust it, kick it, bust it, kick it. <laughs> you got to fight for your right to party. You got to fight. Don't step out of this house if that's the clothes you're going to wear. I'll kick you out of my home if you don't cut that hair. Your mom busted in and said, what's that noise? I said, ah, oh, mom, you're just jealous. It's the Beatsy Boys. You got to fight for your right to party. And, you know, we can look at that, and I don't like bringing my phone into the church, but here's the deal. You'll be surprised how many times we have people, and especially our youth, that gets into some of these songs that ends up guiding them and directing them. And they become rebellious. They become thinking because one of the things that hits them, and I can assure you of this, this song goes much deeper than smoking. It goes much deeper than how they're dressed. It goes much deeper than a lot of things. They're all about the outrage we feel when authority speaks to us that's hypocritical. Uh, they're all about hypocrisy. Now, the, descent, the success of this song depended on one thing, the ability to tap into your use in security. They felt like, Mom, Dad, they just don't understand me. You don't have an understanding of my life. I don't think you understand anything. I don't think you understand. As a matter of fact, Mom, Dad, y'all just stupid. Stay out of my life. Now you may say, Preacher, I'm telling you, this is a fact. And God is speaking in this sermon about such actions. And so I want you to see right now that we feel an authoritary figure is hypocritical. And that's what these songs are teaching our youth. They're teaching them to rebel against their parents until they get their way. The parent knows that the things that they've allowed them to do is wrong, but yet they let them do it anyway. 
they began to see that even though the sinful actions of the child is more important than obeying God, so we begin to lean in and let them have their way until they got their way so far that you never have a chance to lead them and direct them in the right way. In truth, children will become what their parents are. Whoever you are, your children are going to become just like you. And, and it's not what their parents asked them to be, so why is this? Well, first we need to understand the social nature of sin. I might shock you today to let you know that of most of the sin that we perform is a social sin. It comes from our awareness of other people, our, our fellowship with other people, and who that fellowship is with. They begin to entice us, influence us, just as we influence our children through our actions and through our words. You see, social nature of sin and spiritual relationship that exists between a parent and their child. Now you say, are you telling me that the social nature of sin is uh, to understand the child? No, I'm telling you that it's a behavioral and spiritual thing. That spiritual bond between parents and their children, you must understand this sin is social. You see, the family is always in fellowship. It doesn't have to be with a meal. It doesn't have to be with vacation. It's at all time a social and fellowship event. And in this particular time, in this fellowship, you begin to know one another as the child gets to know the parent. You see, sometimes when we have fellowship in the church, we have fellowship in the church for a reason. That we get to know one another, that we can love one another, we can bond with one another. When you see this happening in the family, it's 24-7. They know what you're saying. They know that you might not realize it. They may not tell you that you're hypocritical, but they know that you are by the way you act in front of one person to another. They hear your gossip. They hear the things that you're saying, the things that you dislike, and they bring that into themselves. Now let me explain something. When I was growing up, if my daddy didn't like somebody, I didn't like them either. I didn't have to have a reason. My reason was if my daddy disliked them, I disliked them. And so have you. So have you adopted the same thing. You don't have an idea how much impact we're having on our children. And you must realize they have a thought of who we really are. It's never isolated. And the social society that will directly impact us is going to be more or less our family. You know, you you may say, don't you hang around those people. Don't you dare. They're a bad influence on you. Let me tell you something. The greatest influence comes within the family. What kind of influence are you impacting your children with? When they hear you doing all this talking and all these actions and all the things you're saying, don't associate with them. You know that silly little rap song? My father says, no way you're going to smoke. And that hypocrite smokes two packs a day. Now we see that comically. But you say, don't hang around with these. And yet, what are you doing? You're making a worse influence on them than those that you're trying to keep them from by your ways and actions. You see, the only way, the only way we can convince ourselves that our children would do as we say and not as we do is if we can sever the connection between our sin and our children's character. Now you say, well, I can tell you now, preacher, we, I don't really, I don't really influence, I don't have that, that influence on my child. 
Well, let me ask you something. There's a bond you have with your child. Is there anybody in here that hates their children? Raise your hand. That's a bond. And so therefore, the same bond of love will be the great influence of who you are and what they want to become. They will become what they are looking at and what you're doing, and they learn it naturally. You don't say that, so you use the words. Now, don't you do as I do. You hear me? My child will do as I say, not as I do. Now, that might be your proverb, but I can assure you they're going to learn from you naturally. They're around you for many, many years. You cannot hide yourself in them. You cannot hide the hypocrisy that is in you because they see it. And you influence them. They will become just like you. I'm sorry. It's not a change. It's a fact. And so you have to see the social nature of our sin, and you have to see it here, and it's very, very clear. Our children's characters, uh, we can convince ourselves that our actions carry no, no collateral effects, but I'm here to tell you that they do. And I would also tell you that hoping my children will not inherit my fight. False, but they still inherit them. Let me ask you a question. How many parties that you've attended is marked by social sin? Like alcohol, drugs. How about gossip? How about dirty language? How about nasty jokes? How about things that you know that God would not accept? You see, we breed the social sin. And we are influencing people. People, this is why it's very important that you don't say, hey, I don't, Scott, I don't want you hanging around that drunk. And then we'll talk about the drunk in a compassion that has nothing to win that person's soul. So now I become worse than the person that I'm condemning. And he learns from me that I'm a hypocrite. What's the difference in having a lie told about someone and opinions about someone or someone who takes drugs or alcohol. They're sin. And sin has its place in a lot of people's lives. Our society is marked by the social reality of sin. Look at our government. How do our sins affect our children? Well, they do it in two ways. One of them, they do it by consequences of our sin. And they inherit a way to deal with our sin. Now let me explain what I mean. If I commit a sin in front of my children, now I've got to handle that sin, and they watch how it's done. So they say, okay. As they grow up, they commit the same sin. And they know how to handle that sin. But it's not a godly way. It is constantly pulling in the demonic influence of the evil one into the hearts of the people. You see, my, <coughs> my adultery, so if you think that I'm talking to you personally, I am, and to me too. My adultery influenced my two sons. Uh, my drinking affected my two sons. My filthy language affected my two sons. When I say that children deal with the direct consequences of their parents' sin, the truth of the matter is that our children oftentimes end up paying for our own sin. You see, I sowed adultery into the hearts and minds of my children. Drinking and everything else that goes with it. I cannot take that back. 
And in a moment, I'm going to tell you something that God tells us we must do. So our society is marked by the social reality of sin. When I say that children deal with the direct consequences of their parents' sin, the truth of the matter is that our children oftentimes end up paying for our sins, and they do. The Lord God spoke of this when He told the children of Israel the consequences their children would face for their sins in Numbers 14, 32 through 34. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in this wilderness, and your children will wander into wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms. Now listen to me. Whoredoms is a way of saying prostitution. But it's not only physical sex, as whoredom is mentioned, but it's talking about a faithless society. When whoredom is described, we think sexual. And I'm telling you that when the Bible speaks of whoredoms, it is speaking of sexual, the prostitution of selling yourself, but just the prostitution of a committing spiritual adultery by being a person who is letting sin run their life. You see, the sad thing is we must realize that physical sex is one thing, but how about being faithless? How about being unworthy to come into the worship center? Verse 33, And your children will wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms. That means your faithlessness. What is he talking about? He's talking about your belief. See, on Sunday, you're the greatest believer in the eyes, and and your child's looking at you and saying, Wow, wow, why ain't they this way the rest of the week? And they begin to sort it out, and they begin to see you're a hypocrite. You've come to church, and you're the greatest Christian in the church. But on Monday and Tuesday and the rest of the week, your children see you and they say, who is this? Is this the same person on Sunday as it is on Tuesday? And they say, no, it ain't. No, it ain't. So I can be like that. I can be a hypocrite in church and I can be a hypocrite in the world. Well, I remind you what God said about the hypocrite. They have their place in the lake of fire. You must believe and understand. And bear your hardoms until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. After the number of days in which you search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall you bear your iniquities even 40 years, and you shall know my breach of promise. Let me read another translation of this that's uh, given to you pretty much in layman's terms. But as for you, your dead bodies shall fall in the wilderness, and your children shall be shepherds in the wilderness forty years, and shall suffer for your faithlessness, until the last of your dead bodies lies in the wilderness. According to the numbers of the days in which you spied out the land, forty days, a year for each day, you shall bear your iniquity forty years, and you shall know my displeasure. He says, your, no, your faithlessness. It's going to fall right upon your children because they're just like you. They're going to learn from you. They're going to listen to you. And who you are is who they become. So how can you say, what's wrong with you? Well, it goes right back. My child will do as I say, not as I do. You see, there you planted the hypocrisy in the child's heart and mind. And they can never trust the decision that you make. So now they go out into the world and these beatsy boys and people like these rappers sow the seeds that they're looking for. It fits into what they're listening and looking for because they're not getting an answer through the Word of God because you're not giving it to them. And so when you go out into the world and and you begin to start pulling into the advice and things of the world, you look at Psalm 1 and Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. 
when you listen to the Beatsy Boys, their song is canceling our youth to listen to the ungodly. How many rappers do we have that's constantly talking about murder and killing and, and uh, defunding the police and, and hating the authority in every way? They not only hate, now listen to me, the people that are wanting to defund the police don't realize they're the next defunct because they are not going to stop. They want all authority gone. They can live as they please. I'm sorry, folks. This is, this is the truth. And you have to see it. You know, we may think our children should not have to suffer for our faithfulness, but our protest would be in vain. The same bond and the same closeness that uh, between a parent and a child that makes you love them so sweetly also is close enough for you to wound them and to lead them in the wrong way. The same bond that you love your child is the same bond that will wound them. Now what do I mean by wounded? How many times have you heard this? Well, the reason that person is like he is, he was scarred from his youth. Wounded. You've got to have a wound before you can have a scar. And what has happened is they do not know but one way. And that way is not godly. You have to see again that if you think your sins will not affect your children, you have to think that your love won't. Deuteronomy 12, verses 24 through 28. Thou shalt not eat it, and I want you to listen. This is the command of God. Now, you may think it's silly today, but I'm going to tell you, you better listen. Thou shalt not eat it, you shall pour it out on the earth like water. What's it talking about? It's talking about blood. You shall not eat it. You shall not eat it that all may go well with you and with your children after you. When you do what is right in the sight of the Lord, but the holy things that are due from you and your vow offerings you shall take and you shall go to the place that the Lord will choose and offer your burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood, on the altar of the Lord your God. The blood of your sacrifices shall be poured out on the altar of the Lord your God, but the flesh you may eat. Be careful to obey all these words that I command you, that it may go well with you and your children after you forever, when you do what is good and right in the sight of God. How often do you eat blood? Well, how do I want my steak? I give it to me medium rare. Guess what happens? You go against God. Why? Blood is life. And every impurity that's in that animal, you know have in you. You are feeding your child the same thing because the child wants to eat the same thing you do and be like you. And so the impurities of that animal goes also into the child. God says you must not do it. He said, obey my command. Yeah, but he, he'll, he'll, <laughs> he won't really care that I'm eating it rare or medium rare. And your burnt offerings, the flesh and the blood, on the altar of God. The blood of your sacrifice shall be poured out on the altar or on the ground, but it's not to be consumed. Why? Blood is life. Blood is life. You can live without a lot of things, but you cannot live without blood. You see, when Christ gave His life, he actually gave His blood that you and I may be cleansed. And so you must realize again that when we are not obeying God's Word, we're teaching our children to disobey it because you didn't know. Or if you did, you ignored it because that's the way you like. 
And if that's the way you like it, you're putting yourself before God because it's a commandment of the Lord. Thou shall not eat blood. Now, I know I'll probably get a lot of texts and I could really care less, but I'm going to stick with the Word of God because the Word of God is true and the Word of God is warning us. And let me explain something to you. Does anybody know where the AIDS virus come from? Well, it started in Africa because they ate monkeys and the blood of the monkeys. Ebola. They were eating animals that were infected with the Ebola virus and they did not fully cook the animal and so they ate it and they don't know what to do about it. Because in the blood was the virus. Do you know why God has not let them have a cure for these things? Because they have disobeyed God and have not repented of it. So they don't depend on God, so they go to the scientists. Oh, we'll depend on the scientists to get us well, even though we have AIDS or even though we have Ebola. But now let me say something to you. When you disobey God, you can expect consequences. He will not turn his head and say, that's all right, this time. God will punish sin. Twice in this passage, Moses speaking the words of God mentioned that it may go well with you and with your children after you forever. If the children of Israel reject the commandments of God, it would not go well for them or for their children. On the other hand, should they obey the Lord God, it goes well for them and for their children. In addition to our children facing the consequences of our sins, our children also inherit certain liabilities toward our sins. Our love relationship with our children is so great that our children will pick up bad habits because they have a bond and a love for us. And they'll pick them up naturally. You don't have to teach them. Because they've seen you repeat it so many times. (laughs) And you go back and say, don't do that. And they think, but you do. And so now they're losing respect for the parenting Because now they're saying, don't do as I do. Do as I say do. But it's okay for me, but it ain't okay for you. It's not a sin for me, but if you do it, it's a sin. You see, we influence our children naturally. You know, on the other hand, should they obey, God would take care of it. Our love relationship is there. Some think they live a a sinless lifestyle because they don't drink alcohol or drugs. And so you condemn those who do. And your children see you commanding, saying, don't be like that, don't be like that, don't be like that. Now, they're learning one thing. They're learning that they shouldn't drink alcohol. They're learning that they shouldn't take drugs. You do like I do. Condemn them. Now you're a judge. Now pride's in your life. So instead of them having no alcohol and no drugs, they get a big heffing of pride because you set yourself a club. Instead of teaching them to pray for them, you condemn them. And the only reason you condemn them is because of pride in your life. And so now you give them a big helping of pride. And by the way, God says, I hate that. And you come to church and you're so filled with pride. But you bring that pride in and when you leave the church, you say, did you see that preacher? You know how many times he wore that pink coat? They're looking to find a platform because they're insecure for the condemnation they're getting. 
And we bring that into our church. Won't you think for one minute that they're not consumed Proclaim the Lord God merciful and gracious, long suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. And Moses made haste and bowed his head to the earth and made it. When the Lord speaks of visiting sin, Father upon the children. Why do you think he does it? Why does God say, Daddy, I'm going to visit your children's sins from the third and fourth generation? Notice Moses went and bowed down and worshiped. And do you know why? Because our children will commit the same sin as we do. I had a guy come to me, a gentleman of God. He got colon cancer. He got colon cancer. His daughter was a Christian, and so the church prayed for him. He went to church, and, and he got saved, and kept the bar open, kept, kept serving. And so, I don't understand this. Why? Why has God not healed me? Because I have prayed and I have given my life to God. I said, Jim, I said, have you closed your bar? No, but I'm going to sell it. You've not received it. Do this well, keep it, move it over. You've not received it. You see, you got to trust God. God will replace whatever you think you've lost. Or you may have to go through some suffering because you have put a lot of sinful people out on the highway under the influence and going home and beat their family or beat their wife or beat their children. And let me say this, not going to go without consequences. He died. that the Lord is not going to visit the iniquity of your children to the second and the third and the fourth generation is she should have closed it down and not sold it, break the sin that her daddy had, break it, repenting to God and asking God to forgive her. You say, why? If I commit a sin and I give it to Jimmy and, and influence Jimmy to do the same sin, I've sold him my sin, but I still have a sin. In other words, you've got to understand there's only one way to break the curse, and that is through Christ Jesus by repenting and stopping what you're doing. If it means it's a livelihood, you need to sell it. <laughs> Plain and simple. Sell it. We won't do it. Years ago, I, I was with a company that I was back and forth to Knoxville all the time, flying back and forth. <clears throat> One of the uh, men that was vice president of this company, which is now one of the receiver the champions and all that, that's, that's who I worked for in all those sorts of days. But anyway, he was, uh, he was an ordained Methodist. 
street now. <laughs> but he was taking me a tour of the top. So as we went up the top of Gay Street, heading toward the University of Tennessee campus, we turned, and he said, Leroy, you see that right there? I said, yeah. He said, that's a house. He said, no, they don't mess with it. said, he died. And he gave that poor house to the Methodist Church. And the church started to sell it. Until they realized it was coming in a little over a million dollars a year. children? How did that influence the children of that church? You know, the truth is that we pass our own tendencies to our children should not cause us to forget that Jesus has come to set us free and break that curse by returning them to God. Now, it's wise for children to be aware of the things they may have inherited from their parents. It's crucial that they be aware that they can receive forgiveness and be born again. You know, it's important that the power of Christ can change anything. It's important to understand this. Unless we feel we must be what our parents are. Let me give you proof. We have received parts of them on sin with our first father in Adam. We cannot blame Adam for our sin because they're our own. Scripture teaches both truth side by side. Inclination and responsibility. What do you mean? Well, my daddy ran around and he drank. I was inclined to do it. Am I blaming my dad? No. Because I hated what he did. But I didn't realize I was learning to do the same thing. I inclined to do like the sin. And then I met Christ. I met my responsibility to repent. Because now it's not about my wants and my ways. It's about the souls of my children. And when we don't put that first, I'm not talking about a head of blood, but taking the feet, then we have missed the mark. When your hearts are going to hear, You know, it's really, it's a reality to recognize in Scripture, Deuteronomy 24, 15, and 16. And Moses gives a common, uh, common law about paying uh, hired workers. I want you to listen. You shall give him his wages on the same day before the sun sets, for he is poor to count them, lest he cry against you to the Lord and you be guilty of sin. Fathers shall not be put to death because of their children, but children shall be put to death because of their father. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. 
And the great thing about this is King Amaziah. In 2 Kings 14, 5 and 6, King Amaziah was going to take revenge on those who killed his father. So listen to what he does. And as soon as the royal power was firmly in his hand, he struck down his servants who had struck down the king, his father. But he did not put to death the children of the murderer. According to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, for the Lord commanded, Fathers shall be put to death because of their children. Nor shall children be put to death because of their fathers. But each one shall die. of generational and the truth of personal responsibility lies on the line. And then last, and, and I'll move along with his father's son. My child will do as I say, not as I do. Fails, say it, fails to appreciate the fact that our children are more likely to become what we are than what we say. It is not I who gives you the authority to say. I'm a mailman delivering the mail from God, but you either respect it or you reject it. Second Kings 17, 40 and 41. Howbeit they did not hearken, but they did after their former manner. So these nations feared the Lord and served their graven enemies. Both their children's children, as did their fathers, so do they unto this day. The king of Assyria populated Samaria with idols. They sent a preacher there to try to put a stop to the worship of idols. And he failed because the people showed that it was much easier to worship idols. carries with it a sober reminder of the power of our lives to affect the lives of our children. Their children did likewise, and their children's children, as their father did, so do we to this day. Now listen to this. I go preach in the mountains, and again, I'm going to preach hopefully the 22nd, Jenny's birthday, I'm going to preach the 100th anniversary in my grandfather's church where he was the first deacon. And I'm looking forward to that. And every time I go, they tell me about my grandfather. Some of the older ones that are there were children when he was there. My grandfather died in 1950. And they said up a morning you could see him, whether it was rain or sleet or snow, it didn't make no difference. He had a Bible under his arm and a, and a strap of kindling on his back, heading to light the fires in the camp. Wow. I must have inherited a great deal. Well, I can confuse you right now, but I won't. My grandfather on my dad's side died of cirrhosis of the liver because he constantly drank hot water. Was he a bum? No, he was a super engineer back in the 30s and 40s. He died in 1944 in March same year I was born. I was born in October. I never met him, never seen him. Only in a picture. Now, did I inherit his sin? Well, I look at him, his drinking and carousing. My daddy is drinking and carousing. My drinking my son's drinking and carousing. And still, Jesus became the one we turn to when it's most difficult. Be 
before my son died, I preached this sermon in my house. He said, Daddy, I couldn't be more proud of him than anything in the world. I'm so glad that you got me. That makes me love God even more. You want to break the curse? You see, the problem is we're not looking at what you've already done. You say, well, I've been going to church. I've been doing this. Yeah, but what kind of influence are you giving your children? What kind of influence is your family picking up from you? Is it pridefulness? Is it drugs, alcohol, gambling, sexual things? Is it adultery, fornication? What is it that you see that your children see that's influencing them that is ungodly? You can break the curse. God says, I will break that curse when he comes and redeems you out of this world. Repent. You say, preacher, but I've already done it. Have you repented of the sin that you have recognized today in this message? That you know what you should do? You should break it. Ask him, God, to forgive you. Now, repent means I've turned 180 degrees from that sin and I'm walking away from it. And you know what? Your children are going to watch you. They're going to see whether you truly repent. You don't have to tell them. The most important thing is for you right now is to take the curse off your children by repenting. Telling God sinful lifestyle and I live in somewhat supposedly to make spiritual children and they are influenced by me by other people Paul's shocking declarations in Galatians 2.20 is not only an avenue for lasting change in our life it's the only avenue for lasting change in our home it's a song should have probably had Scott to sing. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the lives I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Children will learn to get what they want. They can never ask for something from both they learn to never say, if mom and dad's together, this is a bad time for me to ask. I'll ask dad. Why don't you ask him? Because mom's in the room. So I'm going to bring mom and mom can ask him. And then later, Show the child the weakness of your vows that you took with your wife. Don't allow it so fast. And friend, let me tell you something. We'll pick it up quicker than you will. Because Satan will make sure that you will not tell the truth. My mom and dad had a very weak temper. I can't depend on both of them. All right? So they go out into the world to look for that temple. And Satan is waiting for Jezebel to come in. We have to see here how much more will a character transformed much life be passed down to our children. Do 
I pray today that this message has been important in understanding that my children, and make this very, very plain, my children will do as I say, not as I say. It's a sign. It's not a problem. If you want them to do as you do, Lord, even though we've tried to live a Christian life, we know now that we can't do it. But we know that Christ can live the Christian life through us. And we will not fall. If just that child depends on them parents, I'd ask the Lord to make sure that we understand that we need to lean on Him. And we depend on Him. His guidance, His provision, pray today, Lord, that if there's anybody here, or maybe it's a grandparent here. Maybe, Lord, it's not a child that's, that's looking to a parent, but a grandparent that is still a child. I ask you, Father, let not your word be sent forth, but let it be a conviction and illustration that leads us to repentance and that law of truth and error. Amen. Hymn number two, then. sins that we have committed. I pray, Father, that you would allow us to repent, Lord, that the influence that we've had on others to be wiped clean, Lord, that they would see the change in our heart that we've given up to you, Lord. And Lord, we give you thanks for all that you do. And Father, we ask that as we go out and rejoice today, we pray that you would go with us and that we would take you, Lord, wherever we may go. And that, Lord, we would constantly look to you to serve you, serve you to your face in everything that we do. Lord, and you would be pleased with us. And Lord, we give you 